Welcome to Natural Habitat Adventures Daily Dose of Nature. Today's topic, Dire Wolves, Apex Predators of the Past. Presented by wildlife biologist Aaron Bott. I'm your host, Rob Mess. Thank you all so much for being here with us today. Over to you, Aaron. Thanks. And thanks, everyone, for tuning in today. Uh, I think this is going to be an interesting subject. Typically, we talk about existent species on our Natural Habitat Adventures webinars, and today we're going to be shaking that up a little bit and talking about uh, relative to some of our existing canids, um, such as wolves and coyotes and domestic dogs. But we're going to go back in time and focus on what I think is a very fascinating species. And despite us having a whole lot of fossils to support the uh, the evidence of their distribution and range across the Americas and the Western Hemisphere. Uh, we just don't know that much about dire wolves until, I should say, recently. We've been breaking some bounds uh, with, uh, in terms of uh, evolutionary and uh, morphological discoveries regarding this incredible animal. So I thought I'd begin by sticking up this really charismatic illustration by Mark Hellett. He's a, a paleo artist and he has some fantastic illustrations from books that I grew up with as a child. And uh, maybe some of you have seen illustrations like this before, depicting the dire wolf and its competition with interspecific predators on the Pleistocene landscape. Well, we're today going to be talking a little bit about the accuracy of some of these depictions and how our understanding of this animal in particular, the dire wolf, has changed as we've come to learn more about its evolutionary history. So without further ado, um, as was mentioned, I'm a wildlife biologist. I'm specifically a wolf biologist. Uh, I have the opportunity to work with and study wolves across the northern Rocky Mountains, but have uh, Worked with a number of other species as well, including grizzly bears and beavers and moose and bison, etc. Um, it's a great job. I love being a wildlife biologist. Um, and in a nutshell, I'm a dog person. I've dedicated my life to working with and studying and managing and conserving uh, gray wolves, Canis lupus. And uh, I get the opportunity to uh, study them in the field, capture and radio collar them. Uh, in order to learn about their social behavior, their spatial behavior. Um, that's what's going on in this photograph here. But I also own a dog. Uh, this is River, my seven-year-old German Shepherd. And she's a great friend. You could say she's my best friend. Uh, I really enjoy taking her out on walks and into the wild. We go off hiking. We have lots of adventures. And for those of you who have dogs or have owned dogs before, I'm sure that you can appreciate uh, just how remarkable these really intelligent and social animals are. Um, therefore, it's no wonder that you are all probably tuning in today, because uh, for some reason, uh, probably a personal reason, you might have an affinity for dogs and wolves and dire wolves and coyotes and a whole bunch of other canids are so closely related to the domestic dog that I think they generate a lot of curiosity and interest. Um, I definitely think that they're, they're a fascinating group of animals and we're going to be talking a little bit about one of their now extinct cousins today. The dire wolf is an animal straight out of the books of fiction, it seems like. Um, I don't traffic in popular fiction too much, but I'm aware that in the last few years, a book series and then a television series known as the Game of Thrones has made the animal, the dire wolf, uh, very popular. Um, but also there's other fantasy books out there that have talked about this large um, kind of morphological uh, giant or monster of the of the gray wolf uh, that kind of exploits this idea of a huge predator on the North American landscape 
as something that is almost fantastic and really uh, straight out of, like I said, fiction, almost a mythological creature. Um, and many people don't realize that the dire wolf was actually a, a real animal that lived during the Pleistocene, during the major ice age. And it specifically lived here in the Americas. And one of the greatest reserves of fossils that we have, actually the greatest reserve of fossils of Pleistocene megafauna or large animals that we have uh, comes out of Los Angeles in the Libre Tar Pits. If you've ever been there, they're kind of famous. If you've ever been there, I'm sure that you've noticed when you walk in that there's this long wall filled with hundreds, if not thousands, of dire wolf skulls. Um, these very old tar pits are actually uh, this bizarre formation of a natural asphalt. It is sticky and oozy. And for thousands of years, literally tens of thousands of years, animals have been getting stuck in these, again, naturally occurring asphalt pits. And as you can imagine, um, a mastodon or some other herbivore waddling through the brush, getting stuck in these tar pits and then struggling and crying out in distress would ultimately attract predators or scavengers. And as more scavengers come in to partake of this tempting feast, they ultimately get trapped and they draw in, of course, more predators or more scavengers to come and um, attempt to consume the meat that is quickly being sucked under. Um, this is something almost comic that we often think about when we're referring to quicksand traps, but these are quite literally traps that have been sucking in life for thousands of years. And because of these libre tar pits, we have an incredible array of fossils of Pleistocene mammals in particular. We have a variety of species that we have found, including some existent species, such as coyotes and even gray wolves that have been sucked into these tar pits. Um, but by far the most abundant species that has been recovered from uh, the excavation of these tar pits has been the skeletons of dire wolves. More than 4,000 dire wolf skeletons have been pulled out of these tar pits, which goes to show just how abundant this species was on the landscape back in the Pleistocene. And it also goes to show, um, or also teaches us a little bit about their morphology as well as uh, perhaps giving us some insight regarding their social structure and social behavior. So when we go to the museum at uh, La Brea or any other good natural history museum, many of us are often captivated by the large megafaunal species and biodiversity that were abundant during the Pleistocene. Um, this is a time when giants walked the earth. Specifically in North America, we had an incredible array of large mammalian creatures that were living on the landscape. Of course, we had mammoths, but we also had mastodons. We had several, several varieties of bison, um, our existent plains bison today, uh, bison bison, was the smallest of the bison that wandered across the North American continent more than 10,000 years ago. We also had camels here in North America. We had the original horses that evolved here in North America before they were uh, went extinct and uh, were ultimately reintroduced by Europeans in the 1500s. Um, we had, of course, to, to prey upon all of these large animals, we had a huge suite of large carnivores that would prey upon these species, including the short-faced bear, which was an enormous bear um, 
somewhat related to the grizzly bear, although much larger, that roamed across the plains. We had an African, or excuse me, we had an American lion living in North America, as well as, well as an American cheetah. We had a variety of felids, including Smilodon, the saber-toothed cat family. Um, and we had the dire wolf, this large relative of the gray wolf that lived in North America and again subsisted off of the incredible biodiversity of herbivores that we had ranging across the landscape. And we've known about these species for a long time. In fact, the dire wolf specifically was first discovered in the 1850s um, in the Midwest, some bones were found and it was recognized that the species might be a distinct uh, member of the Canis genus related to wolves, but we're not really sure, we weren't really sure how they actually tied in with the Canis genus. And was this uh, a, simply a cousin of the gray wolf? Was it something that had come from the gray wolf and the gray wolf was perhaps the original uh, progenitor to the dire wolf or vice versa. Um, also, what did this animal look like and how did it interact with the other animals on the landscape? How did it compete with the other large predators on the landscape? Um, all of these were questions that we didn't really have any answers to for a very long time. The best that we did understand was that there was a very keen relationship between the skeletal structure in the dire wolf and the modern day gray wolf. I've got the two skeletons set up here side by side. You can see their pictures and you can begin to understand that um, there's a lot of similarities when we look at them closely. Um, oftentimes fiction has painted the dire wolf to be an enormous uh, wolf essentially, the gray wolf but on steroids. Um, uh, again, I don't really traffic in popular fiction, but I do understand that in the Game of Thrones television series, the wolves are basically the size of, of ponies. They're huge. They're, the dire wolves are enormous creatures. The reality was very different. Um, as you can see here, the skeleton of a dire wolf is very similar to that of a gray wolf in size as well as in morphology. Um, there's only some very subtle variation here and there. Um, just some slight uh, augmentation of the bone structure helps us to appreciate that the dire wolf would have been beefier, more massive. Uh, it had denser bones, particularly around the head and around the neck, as well as in the legs. And this would have added more mass to the dire wolf than our common gray wolf has today. So on average, Gray wolves are about 100 pounds. Uh, males are typically larger than females by about 20%. Uh, this is standard across most of the Canis genus, and so we could probably uh, picture the same with uh, dire wolf males and females as well. Um, but male gray wolves today are typically about 100 to 110 pounds, and female gray wolves are 80 to 90 pounds. Now, when you compare that to the dire wolf, which had beefier bones and more musculature, uh, the dire wolf probably would have been rolling in around 150 pounds. So a very large canid, but not necessarily bigger uh, in terms of its skeletal morphology, but instead more massive in terms of its musculature. And this is for obvious re reasons. Um, if you're hunting large prey, uh, that are plentiful on the landscape, you need to be able to tackle them. And even though the dire wolf is larger than the gray wolf, it still was much smaller than a lot of the prey species that it was hunting and working to bring down. But for a long time, as I've said, based off of their skeletal similarities, it's been assumed that the dire wolf and the gray wolf probably looked the same, and they actually probably uh, were closely re related. Um, as I mentioned earlier, the La Brea tar pits are 
uh, they're an incredible resource for excavating all of these prehistoric uh, animal fossils. But there's a complication with the asphalt that these fossils are embedded in, which ultimately disturbs the DNA. It makes it almost unreadable. So although we've had a really robust collection of bones to help us understand uh, what these animals looked like, at least at a under the skin level, um, we haven't had the ability uh, to get some really good genome sequencing rolling on from DNA samples, again, because that asphalt from the tar pits really disrupts a lot of that um, DNA research. So based, again, off of the skeletal morphology, we've taken for granted for decades, if not centuries now, that the dire wolf probably looked like a gray wolf, just larger, just more beefy. Again, about 50 pounds heavier, um, perhaps more meat and muscle around the neck, the head, and the torso. Um, the cranium has a, a thicker, larger sagittal crest at the back where you have big jaw muscles which kind of wrap around so that the animal can masticate. Uh, more efficiently. The dentition seems to be a little bit thicker, which again reflects its diet, where these animals are going to be cracking large bones to get at the marrow. Um, but essentially, people were picturing these things as, as wolves, as gray wolves. But all of that has come to change in the last couple of years uh, when uh, Angela Perry and a bunch of other zooarchaeologists published a paper in 2021 after doing some genome sequencing from dire wolf fossils that were scattered across North America. Um, they took a bunch of these genomes and were able to sequence them in order to get a better understanding of the evolutionary uh, history of this incredible animal and they came up with some very surprising findings. And this is a, a phenotypic, or excuse me, this is a phylogenetic graph that I've uh, taken from their paper and stuck right in here into the presentation because I think it's very interesting. Um, but what surprised everyone the most was when they found out that the gray wolf, rather than being closely related to uh, the dire wolf, was actually far removed in its evolutionary history. Almost six million years ago, the gray wolf and the dire wolf's uh, family trees diverged and they split. Today, the gray wolf's closest wild relative is the coyote or the coyote. Um, and to put that into perspective, they diverged over a million years ago. Um, but again, the dire wolf and Canis lupus, the gray wolf, uh, they lack a common ancestor as far back as six million years ago. And you can kind of see on this scale here where the other existent canids are in terms of their relationship to one another. Um, but the dire wolf being the third down from the top on that right hand side is very far removed from the gray wolf. Um, and again, this surprised everyone because of the skeletal morphology we expected them to be more closely related, but the, the genetic story tells something that's very different. And to put things again into perspective, I'd like to take a step back a little bit further and remind everyone that canids, or members of the dog family, belong to the order of carnivora. And that's right here on my graph that I've got. So there's two main branches to the carnivora family, or carnivora order. We've got the felidae, so you've got all of your cats, uh, as well as your civets, your mongooses, and your hyenas, and then of course the now extinct saber-tooths and false saber-tooths. And then we have our other branch of the carnivora tree, which is the caniforms. So obviously you've got your dogs right there in the middle, um, but then we also have bears, and we've got seals and raccoons and your weasel family. All of these members are more closely related, um, going back in uh, looking at the phylogenetics of this order. Uh, but the canid group right there in the middle has some pretty unique uh, 
phenotypic and morphological characteristics. Um, one is this auditory bully at the back of the skull is got some bones that are fused, which makes it uh, different from the cat family. This uh, changes its ability to hear slightly. Also, the specialized carnassials that most members of the order carnivora have, these molars and premolars, which are used for slicing and cutting meat like scissors, uh, have this rather flat plateau on the dog uh, carnassials that we call a talonid. This gives the animal uh, more variety in its diet, more of an ability to be a generalist um, when you compare it to the sharp carnassials of a cat, which lacks this talonid. Um, you can think of cats as being obligate carnivores where they must consume meat. Their dentition and their guts uh, don't give them the flexibility to consume occasional grains or berries or even vegetable matter, uh, whereas dogs have uh, this generalist ability to uh, be flexible in their diet, more so than cats. And then, of course, dogs have this really long rostrum or this snout, which gives them the ability to not only self-regulate their, their core body temperature as they move across the landscape, but it also lengthens their turbinate bones and increases their olfactory capabilities so that they can smell very well, which, of course, dogs are famous for. And again, diving into what we know about wolves and how they have evolved, uh, the members of the Canis genus uh, originated in North America, and about um, several hundred million, or excuse me, several hundred thousand years ago, uh, during the Pleistocene, we had um, progenitors to the gray wolf cross the Bering Land Bridge up in Beringia, where Eurasia connects with North America. And these uh, progenitors to the gray wolf crossed into Eurasia, where the gray wolf emerged eventually as a new evolutionary species. And after evolving in the old world, they crossed back across Beringia into the new world about 130 to 10,000 years ago. So uh, a rather recent um, biotic interchange that's taking place where wolves are coming back into North America uh, really all the way up until the time that people are starting to cross the Bering Land Bridge and populate North and Central and ultimately South America as well. And during this period of 130,000 years ago to about 10,000 years ago, um, gray wolves are um, crossing again uh, across this land bridge. They're coming down into North America in several uh, invasions is what they're called as we study their migration. And what I think is most fascinating about this is the fact that, and I've given multiple presentations on wolves and their abilities to move across the landscape, um, but it's important, again, to reiterate here that one of the superpowers of the wolf, which is least uh, appreciated um, because we're so fascinated by their teeth, is that they are successful as a species because of their ability to walk great distances. Um, they are tenacious, and as the Russian proverb says, a wolf is kept fed by its feet. Um, they can walk really far distances, 20 to 40 miles in a day at least, and because they're so adaptive to their different environments, there's really no geographic variation in their, their uh, DNA and their gene coding. So we have wolves moving across from Europe into North America, and because they're all capable of moving such great distances, they're also breeding with one another, and this keeps the genetic pool very wide. And essentially, Canis lupus comes to dominate the entire northern hemisphere. Now, this is contrary to what we're finding in dire wolves. Um, according to the study published in 2021, uh, the dire wolf probably emerged 
as a distant relative to the gray wolf and emerged solely in the Americas, probably in North America and then moved through Central America and even into South America, the northern portions of which. This map that I've put together here is um, approximate locations of fossil findings. It's not every location, so don't take this map to be exact, but it's just to kind of give you an idea of where a lot of the fossils of dire wolves have been located. Um, for the most part, we find that dire wolves were more, uh, you could say even perhaps neotropic, definitely more temperate than gray wolves tend to be. Gray wolves have a, a vast range and can live uh, through central and southern Mexico all the way up to the Arctic, but they are adapted to living in the cold, whereas we find the fossil remains of many of these dire wolves to be in much more moderate uh, climates when compared to their distant cousins, the gray wolf. Um, and this kind of finding also helps us to understand, you know, perhaps these weren't just gray wolves on steroids. Their coats would have been different. They probably would have been uh, shorter haired or perhaps lighter haired so that they didn't overheat because um, it certainly seems like they avoided some of the more uh, colder regions during this the glacier maximums. Um, they stayed again in more moderate climates. Um, but we find a lot of their skeletons and their fossils <clears throat> again not just in the La Brea Tar Pits in Los Angeles, but down through Florida, um, along the, the Gulf of Mexico, in through Central America. And there's a question about, uh, as this species emerged in the Americas, and as they met the uh, invading gray wolves during the end of their, their time on Earth, um, what would have those interactions been like? Uh, to put things into perspective, we begin finding dire wolf skeletons that we can date as far back as 250,000 years ago. Um, so dire wolves would have been in the Americas much longer than gray wolves. They would have really evolved on the landscape here to meet the demands of existence among such robust biodiversity. Um, and the dire wolf went extinct about 12 to 13,000 years ago. Um, so again, right just for a, a brief few thousand years did dire wolves and gray wolves uh, overlap and very briefly did humans and dire wolves overlap. Humans were just starting to come into the Americas 10 to 20,000 years ago. Um, and no doubt humans and dire wolves would have interacted, but this was at the tail end of the dire wolf's existence in the Americas. Um, again, something that I think is, is fascinating is envisioning this interspecific uh, relationship that these large canids had with the newer canids, the wolves, as well as with Homo sapiens as people came into the Americas. So based off of the recent studies that have been published, we are beginning to appreciate again that dire wolves and gray wolves had probably a lot of uh, phenotypic differences, some physiological differences from one another. This is a great illustration by um, a famous paleo artist depicting an interaction between gray wolves and what he envisions dire wolves to have looked like at a bison kill. Um, and this uh, vision of what dire wolves might have looked like is based off of uh, some of the support from the, the research uh, illustrating how dire wolves, even though much larger, have uh, more uh, genetic relationship to jackals than they do to wolves, actually. Um, again, slightly larger, heavier build, more... Uh, muscular, kind of a dingo sort of uh, look to them as they, again, are living in more moderately tempered zones. But this begs the question of how is it when you have six million years of distance between two species, how is it that their skeletal structures look so similar? Uh, the morphology of their skeletons, again, is pretty spot on. 
of course, they're both members of the order Carnivora. They belong to the dog family. Um, and yet, how is it that their skeletons look so so similar? And this is a perfect example of what we find in nature, which we call convergent evolution. So there are two types of, well, there's more than two, but the two primary types of evolution that we often focus on are divergent evolution, and then there's uh, the lesser common but still appreciated convergent evolution. So divergent evolution is when you have um, two species that have a common ancestor that have changed dramatically over time because they have uh, separated geographically and they've become isolated and they start to show different physical characteristics. Um, one example that pops in my mind is that of uh, the divergent evolution between zebras and horses, for example. Um, common ancestor way back in the books, but clearly they've diverged enough that now we have two distinct species. But we also occasionally will see convergent evolution. Um, <clears throat> now the dire wolf and the gray wolf is not a perfect example of convergent evolution because they do share a distant common ancestor. Um, but convergent evolution is uh, when two remotely um, related species or animals uh, develop the same kind of morphology or physical characteristics uh, because it just makes the most sense evolutionarily speaking. Um, two examples of this would be uh, between dolphins and sharks. Uh, sharks of course are fish, dolphins are mammals, and yet they both uh, independently have evolved in the water to have these very streamlined kind of torpedo-like body shapes as well as the smooth skin to help them uh, swim quickly through the water. Um, you also have uh, convergent evolution in birds and bats. Again, birds, of course, being a feathered uh, group of animals, and you have bats, which belong to the mammalian group, and yet both have independently evolved to take advantage of the air in flight. So here with the dire wolf and the gray wolf, we have two species which, although separated for six million years, uh, because their lifestyle and the behaviors of the two species were very similar, they ultimately developed very similar kinds of skeletal morphology. Now, another interesting thing about the dire wolf and the gray wolf that I'd like to bring up involves uh, a more familiar uh, group of animals that we all know, which is the dog. Um, I've given a presentation on canine domestication, and you can go check that out. It's something that I'm particularly interested in, but it's also something that we don't know a lot about. Uh, we do know that dogs uh, were domesticated over 6,000 years ago, perhaps as early as 32,000 years ago. And uh, dogs were ultimately domesticated uh, or emerged from uh, an ecotype of wolf very similar to our wolf that we have today, um, essentially the same thing you could you could potentially argue. And this is again fascinating because wolves and dogs uh, are very similar in terms of their DNA. And even though we have taken them through artificial selection and we've created a whole bunch of different breeds, um, their DNA is is almost identical. And this process of domestication first began to take place in Eurasia, most likely in Siberia, but we're still not 100% sure on that. Um, and uh, as you can see from this map that I've got up above, the gray wolf has had a, a tremendous uh, historical distribution across the northern hemisphere. And as humans have migrated out of Africa and into Eurasia first and ultimately down through the Americas, their interaction would have been with wolves would have been very frequent. Um, dire wolves again are strictly in the Americas, um, but as people are interacting with wolves on the landscape, we had probably what we assume was a process of domestication by commensalism, uh, which is a fancy way of saying that Wolves probably began the process of domestication 
um, first. They began to follow us and take advantage of human refuse piles, gut piles left behind by hunters, um, and humans probably just ultimately didn't care about leaving the scraps behind for these canines that over many generations were becoming more familiar and more habituated to uh, following human groups around. And ultimately, uh, this opened up a pathway for humans to begin to domesticate wolves and ultimately generate dogs, Canis lupus familiaris. Um, again, you can watch my webinar on, on dog domestication to get more information out of this. Um, it, it's a pretty interesting and lengthy subject. But it's important for us to realize that during this process, we have um, two different forms of selection taking place. We have natural selection, which is um, when nature kind of uh, proves which types of genomes and phenotypic traits are going to be uh, most enduring in a population because they increase an in individual and ultimately a population's fitness. And then we have artificial selection, which is when people step in and we begin to select and choose for genes or, or physical characteristics that we like to see. Um, this is very succinctly summarized by Charles Darwin, where he says, man selects only for his own good, nature only for that of the being which she tends. Um, so as wolves um, made their way into the lives of people and ultimately became domesticated, um, this was absolutely revolutionary. And we started to see as far back as 10,000 plus years ago, um, people beginning to appreciate just how important this kind of technology was and people began to bury dogs, um, specifically in ritualized burial sites, um, because of this uh, rather remarkable um, biotechnology which was formed uh, in this relationship between wolves and people. Um, I keep using the word wolf again because the dog is essentially a wolf. It has that same uh, the same DNA, uh, 99, let's see, where am I at? 99.9% .9 of a dog's DNA is, is ultimately the same as a wolf. But how is this possible when you've got so many varieties such as, you know, chihuahuas and poodles, et cetera? Um, it's important to realize that this is all based off of uh, a modification and not a divergence in the gene pool. So we're turning genes off and on, which ultimately, uh, change the behavior as well as change the, the physical characteristics of the individual, but there's not a divergence. There's not that uh, evolutionary divergence where the animal begins to change. And this kind of biotechnology, I can't uh, emphasize enough, was truly significant. It was the first thing that really gave humans power beyond our own strength. Um, the dog was the first domestic animal um, before anything else, well before plants were domesticated. And the fact that we had this uh, incredible relationship with this canid uh, really changed the course of human history. Um, but for a long time, our dogs were again, essentially domesticated wolves and there was um, very little morphological traits, physical characteristics that would have differentiated a dog from a wild wolf and constantly you had your dogs around your campfire going off and mating with and breeding with wild wolves um, at the edge of the camp. And so when we go back and we're teasing apart the genetics of when domestication actually took place, we really have a hard time of pinning down a solid date until we get about 15, 12 to 15,000 years ago when human villages and agriculture begin to provide a natural barrier between wild and domestic populations. And more grains are introduced into the domestic dog's diet, which make it easier for us to begin to tease apart um, what is actually a dog and what is a wild canid. Now, the reason why I thought that was important to explain is to talk for a second again about the uniqueness of the dire wolf and 
emphasize that there has been no evidence of gene flow found between uh, the other canines, such as the wolf, of course, the domestic dog, the coyote, and these other species as they migrated across the Bering Land Bridge into the New World. Um, there seems to be an, uh, uh, a blockage in the ability for these species to crossbreed. Um, and this is again remarkable because one of the reasons why we still have wolves and coyotes today, these animals that did live during the Pleistocene and we lost species like the dire wolf is perhaps because these animals are so fluid, not only in their foraging behaviors, but also perhaps in their breeding behaviors. Uh, wolves and coyotes and dogs are all capable of, of uh, interbreeding. They can hybridize. Um, but there show that we found no evidence so far to suggest that dire wolves were capable of this. And ultimately, um, this perhaps led to the extinction of the dire wolf as the climate changed and as many uh, megafaunal prey species were lost uh, to, the to the changing climate and to the incoming humans, uh, depending on what the popular theory is at the moment, whether the megafaunal extinction took place, uh, probably based off of a, a matrix complex between uh, invading humans and also climate change, uh, the dire wolf ultimately wasn't able to make the cut. And this is argued because they were more specialized. Um, not only were they more specialized in their foraging behavior, but they were also more specialized perhaps uh, when it came to breeding and they were unable to remain in the gene pool essentially. And as the dire wolf went extinct about 12 to 13,000 years ago, this caused what we call a mesopredator release and wolves and coyotes were able to expand and fill in that niche. And ultimately the gray wolf became the, the top dog on the landscape. Um, I think this is fascinating, again, because it's important for us to remember that <clears throat> that 15,000 years ago, the gray wolf would have not been the top dog in North America. He would have been more of a medium-sized predator. Uh, what we recognize today as our apex predator would have been something uh, less massive than <clears throat> its distant-related cousin, the dire wolf. And with that, I will conclude my webinar. All right, thank you so much. Now, before we start in with the question and answer session, I would like to remind everyone that you can submit your questions via the question field in your control panel. So just to reiterate, you said that um, the dire wolves uh, didn't uh, survive today genetically, so none of their traits have been passed on. Is that, that true? That is correct, that is correct. Do, do we know where the dire wolf got its name from? Um, yeah, it was originally coined in the 1850s, right after the first um, fossils of the dire wolf were found. And it is kind of a descriptor. In fact, I should go back. I didn't mention this, but because there's no, uh, because the genetic variation is so great between uh, the modern wolf and even the coyote, we have up until 2021 been calling the dire wolf Canis direus. Um, it's been listed in the Canis genus, um, but now there's been a lot of debate about suggesting that we, we reorganize the taxonomy of this species to Anocyon direus, which means the terrible dire wolf. Um, Again, referring to its its impressive physique. <clears throat> so this is not yet official, but um, it's something that is being debated. Uh, these animals are, of course, a member of the dog family, but not as closely related to the other members of the Canis genus as we once thought. So do we need to reorganize the taxonomy there? So did do we know, or is it theorized that dire wolves hunted in packs or using pursuit or were they just too happy for that it is 
um, supported by the fossil records that we have, especially around the La Brea tar pits, that these animals hunted uh, in gregarious units, just like wolves do today. Um, we find their fossils commonly grouped together, which often include pups, indicating that uh, these animals traveled as cooperative breeders, um, just like wolves do today. So you would have had a pack probably of a dominant male and a dominant female and a couple generations of offspring, including pups of the year. And uh, they would have hunted very similarly to wolves and ultimately coyotes too. People don't realize or understand that coyotes are also pack animals typically when they're in populations that are unmolested. So could theoretically the gray wolf and the dire wolf could they have mated um there's no genetic evidence to support that they did and if they did copulate there's no um there's no evidence to suggest that any offspring would have been born or if they did if they had been born that they would have uh, been gen uh, reproductively viable great thank you for clarifying that so do we know why or if the um the dire wolf was domesticated um could you just clarify why they wouldn't have been yeah so they weren't domesticated because <clears throat> the domestication process takes a long time um, and again it began in eurasia with people domesticating wolves but really the process would have been more complicated than that where wolves probably were domesticating themselves um, and that overlap between humans and dire wolves would have been uh, so small so brief that any kind of domestication true domestication probably never happened now let me emphasize that there's a difference between taming an animal and domesticating an animal. Um, taming is simply exploiting an individual animal's submissiveness, which is why you can have like a tame bear at the circus. But that's different from a domestic bear where there's been genetic modification, which takes hundreds and hundreds of, of uh, generations typically um, in order to reach a process of complete independence of one species upon another. So could you say that theoretically there was a tame gray wolf, or excuse me, a tame dire wolf uh, in a human camp? Yeah, that's definitely possible, but there's no evidence of domestication taking place. Do we know or have any idea about what their reproductive cycle might have been like compared to other canids? Well, most canids have a reproductive cycle um, which is based off of the photo period so it's off of the daylight cycle and they're all pretty similar so most canids or members of the uh, the canid group canid family uh, are monoestrous which means that they the females go into heat just once a year and even wolves and coyotes again being very uh, distinctly different in their their size and being pretty different in their um, diverging paths of evolution. They still breed at the same time of year and they reproduce at the same time of year, usually about a 62, 63 day gestation period. Um, we're not 100% sure about dire wolves, but I think it's safe to assume that it would have been similar. They probably um, bred around February and gave birth to their pups around April. Um, we do know because canids are an animal that have a baculum, which is essentially a penis bone. Uh, their baculums are thicker and larger than wolf baculums, which gives us an indication that reproductive competition or sexual competition was pretty real it was pretty aggressive in these uh, social group li living animals do we know what the dire wolf ate yeah um, they scavenged on just about anything and they would hunt just about anything just like the wolf 
wood as well. So not large enough to bring down a mastodon or a woolly mammoth or perhaps even a giant ground sloth, um, but they probably would have chased and killed um, uh, elk, bison of several different species, deer, um, camels, and uh, let's see, what else am I missing? Yeah, there's a lot of opportunity that, for them to kind of fill in the niche of of being predator to a large uh, group of, of animals that we'd expect to find in their diet, moose, etc. So is there sufficient DNA to allow for us to bring them back in the future if we so chose? And would that be a good idea? I don't know if there is currently enough DNA for us to, <clears throat> to get to that point. Um, in fact, I'm I'm very skeptical that we have enough DNA to do that. We're currently working on being able to stabilize isotopes where DNA has been difficult to extract, such as from fossils in the La Brea tar pits where the DNA has been disrupted because of the natural asphalt there. Um, we're getting better at, at extracting DNA, so never say never, I guess. Um, and would it be a good idea? I don't know. I think <clears throat> I think there's a the dire wolf would not be the first animal to resurrect from extinction. I don't I think that there would be other species that would merit consideration first. Well, thank you for that answer. Unfortunately, that's going to be the last question that we do have time for today. So I'd like to hand it back to you for some closing comments. Thank you all. Thanks for tuning in. Um, again, what a wild species. And I think it's exciting to find so many discoveries just waiting for us around the corner when we go to our museums. I was just talking to a friend about dire wolves yesterday, and I've got a great book that's five years old and yet is already outdated because of the research that we keep coming up with when it comes to uh, paleobiology. And I think that uh, it's really exciting that uh, we're discovering new things about the relationship of of dogs to wolves and wolves to dire wolves and it's a it's an exciting subject and i appreciate you all for tuning in today aaron thank you so much for taking the time to present for us today and i'd also like to thank everyone who tuned in today now if you're interested in information on how you can travel with nathab Give us a call at the number on your screen, or you can send us an email at info at nathab.com. Our adventure specialists are happy to help you out. Join us Monday for our next Daily Dose of Nature. You can check out next week's lineup, including registration links, on our website at nathab.com slash webinars. We did record today's presentation, and we will have the replay available on our website soon. With that, I will conclude the webinar. Goodbye, everybody. We'll see you next time.